My name is Teresa Pella, and I'm the 2021 president of the Wachiska Audubon Society. Wachiska is an independent chapter of National Audubon with a geographical area that stretches through 17 counties in Southeast Nebraska. The organization's mission includes bringing people together to learn about and protect tall grass prairies as important habitats for birds and other wildlife, to promote birding and to advocate for the natural community that includes human beings. You can track what's happening through Wachiska's website and Facebook, and Facebook page to learn more about how to join in our activities and events. So tonight, the topic of, the, of tonight's presentation is what and how the Wildlife Rescue Team rescues, rehabs, and releases wildlife across Nebraska. Wildlife that they've cared for includes birds, small mammals like squirrels, and larger ones like foxes and bobcats. The Wildlife Rescue Team was created in 1979 here in Lincoln and is a 501c3 organization. So with that, let's please all welcome Carrie Nunez, who is going to tell us more. Thank you so much for having me. Um, my name is Carrie Nunez, and I am the current president of Wildlife Rescue Team. I am also the Virginia Possum Team Leader and the Bird Team Leader this year. And um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here real quick. Can everyone see that? Yes. OK, thank you. All right. OK, like I said, my name is Karen Nunes. I'm going to give you a little bit of information about myself. Um, I am a mom of four children, and I've always loved wildlife. And um, I, you know, I'm outside all the time, hiking, exploring nature, that sort of thing. Um, once I had kids, um, I decided I wanted to teach them as much as I could about nature and wildlife. So I did become a Nebraska Master Naturalist. Um, and that would have been, no, oh, I want to say 10, 12 years ago, maybe, I guess. But, um, and I fell in love with learning as much as I could about um, outdoors and nature and wildlife. And if you know anything about Nebraska Master Naturalist program, um, you need to do 20 hours of volunteer work, which um, is easy to do <laughs> to keep your certification if you're passionate about um, being a master naturalist. And so that's where I started. And then um, I wanted to do more. So I became a visitor services coordinator at a wildlife safari park, which is in Ashland there. It's owned and operated by the Omaha Zoo. And I was there for three years and then wanted to do more. So I joined the education team at the Omaha Henry Dooley Zoo and Aquarium. I was the scout and the program coordinator for Wildlife Safari Park for five years. And um, then um, my parents do have some health issues. So I did leave that job so I could be closer to Lincoln. And currently I am a, a breastfeeding educator from Milkworks and I am now a instructor for wildlife rescue, or I'm sorry, for wildlife safari park. Um, so those are my paying jobs. Um, wildlife rescue team is all volunteer work. And it's really like having two full-time jobs and not getting paid for them. Um, but I really uh, enjoy it and it's um, very rewarding. And um, like I said, I was a president this year. Um, I have been the opossum rehab team leader for um, seven years now, and then the Songbird Rehab Team Leader uh, this year. And that, that number there, that 402-473-1951, that is our hotline number, and I'll talk a little bit about that um, in just a minute. Okay, so what is Wildlife Rescue Team? Um, we were created in 1979. Um, we are a nonprofit, all volunteer based organization, and we are um, dedicated to raising and rehabbing orphaned and injured wildlife that are native to the state of Nebraska. Um, and our goal and our permit um, only allows us to be able to release them back into the wild. Um, we're not able to um, keep them, um, they have to be releasable. And we all work out of our homes. 
Um, and in the state of Nebraska, um, there are three permits um, where, where that are allowed to rehab um, native wildlife in Nebraska. Um, one permit is ours, uh, Wildlife Rescue Team. Another permit is Nebraska Wildlife Rehab. Um, they actually have a facility and actually building a facility um, in Omaha. And um, they do the same type of wildlife that we do. Uh, and then there's Raptor Conservation Alliance and they focus only on raptors. And uh, Nebraska Wildlife Rehab Wildlife Rescue Team um, are not allowed to rehab um, raptors, only raptor conservation um, can do that. Um, but the animals that we typically rehab, so this is 2018 um, numbers, but in 2018, we cared for over 2,700 animals. Um, we received thousands of phone calls um, every year. I feel like this year um, it has been a record year for phone calls in animals. You know, we're not sure why that is yet. You know, hopefully we'll, you know, do some um, research and find out, um, you know, why some years are, you know, harder on animals than others. Um, but in 2018, as far as mammals, you know, you can see we do get a majority of our mammals are, are cottontail rabbits. And then we have the raccoons, squirrels, opossums, and bats. And then waterfowl, um, the wood ducks and mallards are a majority of waterfowl that we do get in. Um, songbirds, um, I know for a fact those numbers there, um, since I did songbirds this year, um, I would say have at least tripled uh, this year. And um, so we've got the robin, finch, sparrow, pigeon, doves, those are um, pretty common. Um, but I've also gotten kingfishers in, um, uh, um, I'm just trying to think of other ones that, you know, the, the a warbler, um, night hawks are other birds that we've gotten in this year. Um, reptiles, we do, you know, turtles, snakes, um, snapping turtles um, are a big one. You know, they get hit a lot by cars. Um, so rescuing birds, that's, a, that's probably one of our biggest um, um, number of animals that we're rehabbing right now. Um, we can care for any bird with our permit. Um, if the permit comes from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, um, because of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, we can handle birds until they're released. The most common birds we care for are songbirds and waterfowl. Uh, baby birds, I can tell you, need to feed, be fed constantly. <laughs> I have a family of six and it's a family affair. Uh, when we keep our baby birds in the hallway or in the bathroom. Um, so every time you're using the restroom, every time you're walking down the hall, um, you are putting um, food in inside the little bird's mouths. Um, they will squawk and open their mouths every time they hear you walk by. <laughs> so it's a very, uh, very time consuming, very uh, busy uh, job for sure. Um, you can tell a time of year by bird calls. Um, and what type of birds um, you are being um, sent to rescue. Um, robins, grackles, and sparrows are big in the springtime. And then we've got ducks and geese around Memorial Day and then swallows, swifts, um, doves, um, which right now pigeons and doves are a lot of the birds that I'm rescuing uh, right now. Uh, blue jays uh, are also the beginning of summertime. And um, it also depends on the time of year if you're getting fledglings in, nestlings, fledglings. Um, we, they do have, you know, more than, um, some have three to four clutches of babies a year. And uh, so just when we think that we're done with uh, baby nestlings, we get a call about another nestling bird. So, and then right now we are getting a lot of nighthawk calls. Um, and I'll talk a little bit, bit about that in just a moment. Um, so why do we get birds to rehab? Um, there have been a few um, pretty big storms this summer, uh, storms and windy days. Uh, so that's when nests are falling from trees. There are some birds that don't um, build very strong nests and they, they um, will blow easily from a tree. And so when it's a stormy day, we can count on getting a lot of phone calls the next day. 
Um, another big thing uh, that happens is we do um, have a lot of us community um, people that want to help that are just trying to help. Um, but what happens is they're actually, you know, bird napping the babies from their families. And that can be a big issue. So a, a big part of our job is calling the public back and kind of talking them through, you know, when a bird needs help or when an animal needs help and when it's best to leave them with their family. Um, a lot of the public is very receptive to that. They, um, they understand that we're professionals and we know um, what's going on and how to help them. There are some um, that just think they absolutely need help and the, the bird or the animal isn't gonna survive without us. And you know, if that happens, we do tend to just um, go ahead and pick them up and um, take care of the animal just to put them at ease. But most of the time we can talk them into leaving them. A couple of myths, um, you can try to put them back in the nest if they fall out. We do instruct them how to make a fake nest. We also explain that birds cannot smell. So it is okay to touch them and that put them back in the nest, mom will come back. Um, we always um, do tell them if you're, they're handling any wild animals at all to make sure that they're wearing some sort of glove, gardening gloves, um, disposable gloves, something like that, if they're going to touch an animal. And some people will do exactly what we ask them to do, touching animals. There's others that will not touch them. Maybe they are scared of birds. Maybe, you know, um, they just don't feel comfortable and that's okay. We will send a volunteer out to help them. Um, another thing that happens with birds um, is dog and cat attacks. Um, cat attacks are the number one reason that birds need to be picked up and rehabbed. And to be honest with you, once a cat gets a hold of a bird and penetrates, um, that bird usually doesn't make it, almost always doesn't make it. So we do talk to the public a lot about that, making sure they keep their cats inside, you know, keeping the feral cat population down, that is a, that's a big issue. Um, so if that's one thing I can ask everybody to do tonight and, you know, every day is keep your cat inside, um, do what you can to help the feral cat population. Um, another reason we get birds to rehab is adult birds. Um, they hit windows or cars. We talked about this earlier. Um, when that happens, um, a lot of times I will ask them to you know, if they don't see any visible injury, like a broken wing, a dragging wing, blood, things like that, um, maybe the bird's just sitting there kind of stunned. We do, um, a lot of times I will ask them just to put it in a box and keep it comfortable. And, um, you know, if it's the next morning, um, they can open the box and see if it'll fly away. So we do a lot of educating and ins instructing and um, trying to get the public um, interested in um, rehabbing and um, then we also did talk about um, bird diseases. So we we're talking a little bit about that before everybody got on. Um, there is a bird disease that is said to be going around um, the country right now. It hasn't officially been found in the state of Nebraska, but um, Nebraska Game and Parks, Fish and Wildlife, they are trying to keep um, tabs on that. If you do find a bird um, that has crusty eyes, um, is lethargic, uh, maybe kind of wobbly, um, or has passed away, they are saying, you know, to pick those birds up, of course, with gloves. Um, never handle it with, that, with um, your bare hands. Um, pick that bird up, put it in a box. You know, call our hotline, Wildlife Rescue Team, you know, Game and Parks, if you have a um, animal control in your um, town, you know, give them a call. And uh, we do have some birds that are being tested right now for um, that different diseases. They don't just test for a certain thing, but they like to do necropsies on them to find out what is making them sick and what is what they might have died from. Um, goat finches do get conjunctivitis like we do. And so they'll have the crusty eyes, you know, of course, um, when they have crusty eyes, they can't fly. They might fly into things. Um, so go ahead and give us a call if you find a finch like that or any, any animal that you think might be sick. Um, some of the typical birds that we pick up, of course, are robins. 
Um, so um, we've got the hatchlings, nestlings, um, and hatchlings actually don't even have any of this fur or this color. You know, they're pretty bald and um, you can't ever really tell what kind of bird they are until they start getting some feathers. Um, the second one here is a, is a fledgling, an older fledgling. Um, fledglings will typically have a lot more fluff. Um, they'll have that speckled um, chest there that you see. Um, even um, the, the rehabbers that do birds, it can be very difficult to identify a bird when they're really small. Um, a lot of times you have to listen to their call, see how they feed. Um, and a lot of times if you don't know what they are, you don't always know what they are eating either. So you might have to, if you don't know exactly what it is, we have to kind of um, try different things to see what, what they will um, eat. Um, fledglings is a big one that people try to pick up. You know, I, I try, I tell them when someone sends us a call about a bird, I have the public immediately send me a picture. I look at the picture, I ask a few questions, um, and then I decide if this is a fledgling that needs to be left there. Um, if it's hopping around in the ground and um, kind of wobbly, people think that their wing is broken. You know, I tell them that they're kind of like awkward teenagers. You know, they're on the ground, haven't quite got, you know, out, and toddlers, I guess, not teenagers, I'm sorry, awkward toddlers. They haven't quite got their feet underneath them. They're kind of wobbly. Um, and, but if, if you go close to that bird and you hear an adult um, squawking or even dive bombing you, that's a good sign that the parents are there and to just leave the bird alone. The parents will take care of it. Now, if it's been there a couple of days, you haven't seen any adults, it's not moving, it looks like it's getting weaker, then of course you'll need to call us so that we can help. Um, so here's some others. There's some finches, purple, goldfinch, you know, all different types of finches. And like I told you, they do um, get pink eye. So if you do pick up one of these birds, make sure you got gloves on. Don't rub your eyes because it can be um, contagious for you too. Um, doves are one that we pick up a lot. This um, one here on the left, the little one, that is um, a fledgling. Um, if you've ever watched a dove, which I'm sure a lot of you have, they're on the ground a lot. They're not like songbirds, you know, they don't flutter around and fly away quickly. It does look like they need help a lot of times from the little ones to the adults. And um, so a lot of times we will tell them just to, you know, leave them, you know, and see how it goes for, you know, a few hours even. Um, the little dove um, on the left there, that one probably fell out of a nest. Doves are one that don't, they don't build very strong nests. So if there's any kind of wind, they're tumbling out. So if they're on the ground, they probably need, they will need help. And um, so you'll need to give us a call. And one thing about doves is they need a deep dish to drink out of, because they will um, stick their beak in and like suck up like a straw. And so little doves can be, we bottle feed them. And, um, you know, I keep them for a couple months at least. Uh, we get a lot of phone calls about pigeons that have bands on them. And I will pick up um, banded pigeons, um, but a lot of times I will tell people just to leave them. They are, they're in your yard because they are tired and they're hungry and they're thirsty. If you can put out some food and water for them and just enjoy having them there, a lot of times after a couple of days, they will fly away because they have a goal. Their goal is to get from one place to another place. They are, they are racing pigeons and they have a home. So if there's a band on them, they are on their way someplace. Now, if they look injured, that's a different story. But even when I get um, banded pigeons, um, I will look at the bands and there is a number on there that identifies each of those pigeons. So there is a website, a racing pigeons website where you can report that band and you can find out exactly where that pigeon came from and you can contact their owner by email. So if you ever are to find a racing pigeon, um, you can reach out to us and I can give you that email. Um, or you can ju just, um, you know, Google Racing Pigeons Association, I think is what it's called. And um, it's really fun to do with kids. They love to, you know, find out who the owners are and where those pigeons have come from. 
Um, so we do have, we do waterfowl also. Um, now this is probably a good time to talk about our, our um, hotline. So when you call our hotline, they will ask you um, where, you, where you are, you're at, your address, um, what type of animal you have found, and then um, your contact information. So then our answering service will forward your information to our team leaders. So like I said, I'm the opossum team leader, bird team leader, we have a waterfowl team leader, bat team leader, raccoon, you know, um, different species for different, different team leaders for different species. Um, so waterfowl, um, these are some of the ones that we get in. Uh, wood ducks, um, Canada geese, mallards. Um, when you're talking about ducks, um, mallards are, are fairly easy to rehab. Wood ducks, wood ducks um, will die um, as quickly as you look at them. They're, they're very, very fragile um, and they spook easily and um, can be very difficult to rehab. So if you see any um, type of wildlife with a mother or father present, a parent present, um, we, we ask that you just leave them with them. They have a better chance out in the wild you know, than they would with us. Um, nests, we get a lot of phone calls about nests and moving um, eggs. That is illegal. Um, you're not allowed once a, a songbird, a waterfowl, anything um, makes a divot in a nest, you are not allowed to move that nest, even in a bird box, it's illegal to do that. Um, so if people call and ask us to do that, we tell them we can't. We can't do that. Um, we can't even, we're not even allowed to um, trap mammals and relocate them, you know, because it could be during baby season and they could have babies that they're trying to take care of. So we are not a relocating um, organization. We, um, you know, pick up orphaned and injured wildlife and then rehab them, but we do not relocate. Um, so we get Canada geese, snow geese, you know, a lot of calls, you know, where they see um, birds on, out on the lake um, that might have fishing line and things like that um, tied around them. Um, so that's definitely a call to us. It can be difficult <laughs> to catch those um, birds, even if they have fishing line on them, um, but we try our very best. We'll get our kayaks out there and um, go out on the lake and, and try to help them. A lot of times we have you know, animal control is helping us or game and parks. You know, it takes a, a team effort to do that. Like I said, we're all volunteers. You know, and at times there's only maybe, you know, one person available. We all work um, part-time jobs, full-time jobs, have families. Um, so it can be difficult to um, get to every animal in a timely fashion, but we definitely try. Um, as far as fishing line, um, that's another thing. We ask people to make sure they're picking up trash and fishing line and hooks and you know, cleaning up after themselves to, you know, to avoid those human impact um, injuries. Okay, cottontail rabbits, um, that's another one. People will call and say, I've got bunnies in my backyard, come pick them up, I don't want them there. Our answer is, we can't do that. We do not do that. Um, you need to uh, leave them um, and, you know, keep, you know, the dogs and cats away. They, they, um, Rabbits, that doesn't take long. It takes just a few weeks um, for them to be old enough to hop away. If they are hopping away from you, if they can hop away from you, they're good. They're fine to be left alone. You know, of course, if a dog gets a hold of a bunny and it's bleeding and injured, then of course we want to call a phone call. Um, a lot of times people think that mom isn't around. Mom hasn't been here all day. Mom literally comes and sits over the nest for a couple seconds and then hops away. And it's always when in the middle of the night when nobody's watching, when there's no predators out. She doesn't wanna draw any attention to that nest. Um, so it's best just to leave, leave the nest. Um, so they'll leave it when they're about a month old. And like I said before, if they can run away, you can, they are good to go, you can leave them alone. We also get squirrels and ground squirrels. We've had a lot of squirrel calls the last few weeks with that windstorm. Um, and these are um, newborn babies that we're getting still. Um, they can have a couple different uh, litters a year. We do have black squirrels, so that's a gene mutation of the fox squirrel. 
Um, right now we have one rehabber that has over 25 um, squirrels. So everyone that's doing squirrels right now has at least a dozen squirrels that they're taking care of. Um, and they're fed every um, three to four hours. You have to feed these little guys. Oh, sorry, I need to go back here. Okay, opossums. So I'm gonna go off on a tangent here <laughs> because I am the opossum rehab team leader and they are very misunderstood and very fascinating little um, creatures. They are the only marsupial in North America. Um, moms can have um, up to 13 babies in their passel. Um, a group of opossums is called a passel. Um, they're very um, useful, beneficial to our environment. They can eat crickets, insects, mice, ticks, dead things. Look at those adorable faces. <laughs> Um, so mom can give birth to 20. However, like I said, there are only 13 available. Um, let me see if I missed one. I'm sorry, here it is. Okay, so the females are called Jills, the males are Jacks, and the babies are Joeys. Um, they reproduce twice a year, so early February and late July. Um, two weeks after mating, the jelly bean sized Joey um, right there does crawl. It's real tiny, not all of its limbs are formed yet. Um, it has a special um, claw that it uses to climb up um, the mom's belly and go into the pouch. And um, they, they then swallow um, the mom's um, teat. And so it's like a, a tube that they swallow. And then their mouths will seal around that teat for two to three months. And then while mom's walking around, taking babies with her, milk is being pumped into those baby's tummies through her teeth. And so if you see um, a mom opossum that has been hit by a car, um, we always ask that people check her uh, pouch to see if there's a babies in there, because nine times out of 10, the babies um, are not injured, even if the mom has passed. We picked up some babies that, um, whose mom got hit by a train um, and of course the mom did not survive, but all the babies inside the pouch did. So um, that pouch is uh, very um, good at keeping those babies safe. Um, so like I said, two months, they um, will stay inside mom's pouch and then eventually those teeth will shorten and their mouths will unseal and then they'll be able to get, go in now the pouch. Um, if we get a call and the um, babies are less than two months old, then we do have to remove them um, from the mom's teeth and we have to tube feed them. Um, so that, that is a, a lot of work too. You know, we do that every, you know, three to four hours. Um, and so um, then after four to five months, uh, mom is ready to, to mate again. And one thing about um, opossums that their lifespan is only two to four years. And so they have, they have a very short life and um, you know, it's a struggle. A lot of people don't like opossums. Um, all of these pictures, is all the pictures of these opossums, except the one with the babies on the back. Um, those are all opossums that um, my family and I have rehabbed. Um, we've been with um, Wildlife Rescue Team for seven years and we've rehabbed and released over 600 opossums. Um, and this is kind of the process. Um, you've got the babies, and this is kind of what you do for all um, babies that come into our care. It doesn't matter if it's a, a bird or a mammal, um, a waterfowl. You know, the first thing you do is we get them warm. We get them um, on some low heat, and then we hydrate. Um, and then mammals, we do have, you can see my daughter there with a little Kleenex. We do have to potty them like um, their moms would, so a little warm. Um, paper, wet paper towel to potty them. Um, and then that's us tube feeding. And then they eventually um, will graduate up to lapping on their own. And here's some more that we have um, rehabbed. They all have different personalities, different um, looks. Um, some can be real feisty like that one in the middle there. Um, he was um, feisty from the get go. <laughs> Um, he was always very defensive and you want them to be like that because in the wild, um, they need to be able to protect themselves. They'll hiss and um, snap at you. 
Um, then there's others that are very sweet from the very beginning and we have to work on trying to wild them up before they're released. Um, this picture I'm showing you because it's very interesting. These were opossums that we rehabbed last year. Um, they were um, the second batch of opossums that came through. And if you notice, their fur is extremely full and thick. We have never had opossums um, that have had fur this, this um, thick and full until this past year. And then guess what? We kind of had a rough winter this year, right? Lots of cold. So I feel like they were, they were adapting to what the weather was gonna be like. Um, and then when spring came this year, when we should be getting a lot of opossum calls, I hardly got any opossum calls. So, you know, we're concerned, you know, I was concerned that a lot of possums didn't make it through the winter. Um, and so I've had maybe a third of the opossums that I normally have each year. So it was a real hard um, winter for opossums. Um, so we also do raccoons. Um, we have um, raccoons that um, get raccoon calls um, from country, from cities. You know, they'll nest in trees, buildings, wherever they can find a safe, comfortable place for their babies. Um, in Nebraska, rabies is not found in um, raccoons, but we do find them with distemper. Um, rabies is probably another thing I should tell you about opossums. Their body temperature is too cold to carry um, rabies. Um, so they um, do not have some of the typical mammal um, diseases, but uh, distemper is a big one with raccoons. Um, raccoons are super cute when they're little. Um, they are very friendly. They um, bond very quickly with humans, especially ones that are feeding them. Um, but even ones that are being fed by um, rehabbers, they do get wild and mean and can bite easily. Um, they are not pets. And we have to remind all of our rehabbers about that, you know, especially the new uh, rehabbers you know, because these little raccoons are so adorable. But as you can see, they start off um, little and we have them in little comfy um, uh, things. This little basket that they're in, um, we have people that um, knit those for us. So if anyone is a, um, likes to knit, we do like these little um, pouches and little, um, little comfy nests for our wildlife. And then they do eventually, um, move up into bigger enclosures and to help them get wild. And, you know, there's a point where it's completely hands off. You put them in there, um, in their enclosure and we feed and water, but that's it. There's no um, talking to them, no touching them because we want them to, you know, be ready for the wild. Um, we also do fox, coyote, bobcats, some of those small, those larger mammals. Um, we have a rehabber that doesn't live in town. She's out in the country, so she handles our larger mammals. And then they are released back in the country, not back in town. We do try to release our animals um, close to where they were found. That's not always possible. Um, so we do have people that volunteer their land um, for some of these releases too. Fox and coyotes, we get a lot of calls about mange. And if that's the case, you know, it's hard to catch these animals, um, but we do have medication that we can, you know, put on nuts and seeds and things like that for um, squirrels and fox and coyotes that do have mange. So we're not taking them out of the wild, but we're actually, you know, helping um, medicate them, um, you know, while they're still out in the wild. Um, we also get a few beavers, badgers, minks, and woodchucks. Um, they're, of course, found new, near water and in dens and burrows. We have farmers that call us a lot of times um, with these. Um, you know, woodchucks can um, kind of be a, a nuisance. And so we do get a lot of calls about coming to get the woodchuck to relocate. Again, we, we don't relocate. Um, if it is injured or orphaned, you know, then we can take them in. Um, turtles and snakes. So turtles do cross the road to lay their eggs. Um, we do um, tell people if you see a turtle crossing the road, um, go ahead and make sure you have gloves on, of course. And um, you can uh, you know, be very careful when you pick them up because they can swing their head clear around to bite you. But if you can um, try and help them cross um, the road in the direction that they're going, that would be great. If it does get hit by a car, um, we do um, ask that you call us 
It can take a really long time for um, them to be in rehab if they have an injury um, such as that, but it is, um, we can rehab quite a few of them. So um, snapping turtles, of course, you really don't, you don't wanna handle them. You know, you can use a shovel box, something like that um, to move them, but they will bite a finger off. So definitely not um, picking them up. Um, and then snakes, we do get some snakes um, and um, you know, that can be picked up if they're injured. We've got, give me one second. I'm gonna put my dog out of the bedroom. <laughs> Okay, sorry about that, guys. Okay, so um, snakes, and we have gotten frogs, um, especially little kids, they like to call us. Um, they'll pick up a frog. We had a, a frog that we had in rehab quite a, a while that had um, been run over by a car and so was missing a limb. And um, it was able to be successfully released, um, believe it or not. So um, even if they lose a, a limb, um, you know, there's a chance that they can be released. Of course, we won't release them unless we know that they can survive out in the wild. And then, so how can you help? Um, so of course, we want you to share um, what you've learned today, um, share um, information about a wildlife rescue team. Um, we do ask that you keep um, pets indoors at night, um, putting bells on cat collars to warn wildlife. Um, finding a dead possum, check its pouch, you know, helping turtles cross the road, um, doing everything you can to avoid um, human related injuries, um, keeping lids on trash cans tight, covering window wells. Um, we do get a lot of phone calls, you know, about animals that have fallen in window wells, especially in um, downtown businesses and things like that. So covering those window wells would help a lot. Um, we do have a website, um, Wildlife Rescue Team Inc. Nebraska.org. Um, we have social media, Facebook, Instagram. Um, we're always looking for volunteers. Um, it's really easy to be a volunteer on our team. Um, you do, you get on our website and um, there's a spot there, how to become a member. Um, we do have um, membership fees. It's $20 for an individual or $30 for um, a family and that's for a year and then you are part of our permit. Um, that doesn't mean that we want you picking up you know, all the animals and rehabbing them yourself. Um, we do um, ask that if someone does contact you about an animal that you refer them to our hotline and then it will go to a team leader um, and then they will get in contact with someone in that area or someone that specializes in that animal. Um, we do have monthly meetings. So we meet the second Tuesday of every month at um, there's a church on 23rd and Washington Street in Lincoln that we meet at, um, but we're also um, trying to do more um, Zoom trainings and things like that. We're trying to up our um, training since we are a statewide organization. It's hard to, you know, get all of our rehabbers in one place at one time. So we're trying to use this um, technology to um, get some training um, done there. Um, and then, of course, you know, go ahead, you know, try to volunteer for other organizations like such as, you know, all of you with Washuska, you know, um, bit of getting involved in those organizations. You know, I'm not saying I want everyone to join our team and nobody else's team. You know, Nebraska Wildlife Rehab, Raptor Conservation Alliance are really great rehab um, teams, but um, you need to be part of someone's permit to actually um, rehab wildlife in the state of Nebraska. And I think this is really cute. Look, Ma, a human, ooh, don't touch it. They carry diseases. <laughs> and that is my presentation. Okay, <laughs> yeah. that's cute, that's <laughs> cute. Uh, okay, let's open it up for the floor while Arliss is Risa? looking to see if there's, yeah. Yeah, I do have a couple um, in the chat room. Okay. Um, First one is, I believe opossums are used in some manner for preparing snake bite anti-venom. That's correct. They are, yes. Okay. Wow. And is, 
Are you going to elaborate or should I go to the next one? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I don't know exactly, okay. but I do know that, that yes, okay. they are, they're immune to snake bites. Yes. Okay. The next mm -hmm. one is, do you have some advice on bat rescue and care? Sure. Okay. So Nebraska bats, there's 13 species of bats in the state of Nebraska. Um, the one thing about um, bats, they do not take off from the ground. So if you do find a bat on the ground, it needs help. You can put it up on a tree, um, a building, um, something like that. Um, and, um, you know, rabies is very rare. You know, it's 0.01%, I believe, you know, in the state of Nebraska for um, bats with rabies. Um, but we still don't want you picking them up, you know, with your bare hands. Um, if you can do a, a shovel, something like that, um, uh, a broom, you know, something to pick them up and then lift them up into the to a um, a a tree. Um, if you have bats in your attic or in your house, um, you want to make sure that you call, um, you know. Some call us and we'll give you some advice on who to call to try to get those um, holes and stuff boarded up. But you want to do it when it's not baby season. You don't want to board up those holes when there's babies in there um, because then the parents can't get in and out to feed them. Um, so yeah, we you can we have a bat team leader. Um, Lynn Knutson's our bat team leader, so she's always really good at um, giving getting advice about how to take care of bats too. And another question is, can you give the hotline number again? Sure. Um, it's 402-473-1951. Oh, I've lost. That's all I have for uh, questions so far, Teresa. Okay. All right. Any, any from the floor? Marilyn? I wondered why there weren't more boxes. They've been hanging out in my neighborhood. And uh, in your first list, there weren't boxes listed. Is that you know, Go ahead. So yeah, so that list is just um, an idea of how many um, fox calls we go on. So that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, how many foxes we have. And like I said, um, that's changed since 2018. Um, I feel like we have a better system of recording our acquisitions and how many um, animals that we rehabbed. Um, but we don't take a whole lot of um, those larger mammals in um, just because they are, they're difficult to catch, you know, even when they're injured. They're very, I know there's been, I don't know where you're from, but I know in Lincoln, um, they're was a fox that we were getting several calls on that had a PVC pipe. Um, its head stuck in a PVC pipe. And, um, you know, its head was out, it was just like around its neck, like a necklace. And we had several organizations trying to catch that a fox. And they'd set um, live traps and things like that. And they kept catching every other fox except that fox. <laughs> They're very they're slick and they know, you know, when, you know, they, they're trying to get caught and they do everything they can not to get caught. So those are actual numbers of animals that we've been able to catch and to rehab. That doesn't mean it's, you know, we haven't gotten the calls about them. Okay. And I'm in, in West Lincoln and they do seem to be popping up here. Um, yeah. So every time, um, I, gosh, I want to say like eight out of 10 times, if there's a a small animal or a bird or anything. Um, one of the biggest comments is we have fox in the neighborhood. Um, that baby's not safe. We have fox in the neighborhood. So I hear that from a lot of people, especially yeah. in Lincoln. I also wanted to thank you for improving my opinion of opossums. Oh, that was my <laughs> that was my biggest goal. Thank you. <laughs> it worked. It worked for me anyway. Good. Thank you. <laughs> No, I was going to say the same thing, Marilyn. Yeah, yeah. My respect for opossums has has yeah. moved up a notch. Oh, thank, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Good. <laughs> Yay. Yeah. What did they? Whatever happened to that fox that had it? Um, did they ever catch that fox that had the uh, a PVC pipe? Or you know what? 
I don't know. I'd have to ask our um, rec, our, our Fox team leader. I don't know what the last, I do know it was for weeks they were trying to catch that Fox, <laughs> but I'm not sure what the outcome was. I don't know. Well, you know that, if he hit or get his head in the PVC pipe, he's dead. Eventually. Yeah, yeah, because if it was if it was a young fox, yeah, for sure. So yeah, I don't know. But if I do find out, I can let um, Arliss <laughs> know, and she can she can let you guys know. How about that? Okay, yeah. Harry, uh, yeah. how how many people? What percentage of people do you think are are feeding um, animals in town, and is that permissible or advisable? It's not. It's not advisable. <laughs> Um, you know, as far as birds, you know, go, if you're going to start feeding birds, you want to make sure that you're, of course, feeding them throughout the whole, the entire winter. Um, and even other animals, if you are feeding them, you know, you're not, that's not legal to do that. Um, but if you are, you want to make sure that you continue to feed them throughout the, the entire year, because you, you don't want them relying on you and then winter comes around and they have nothing to eat. Yeah. This is Ken Ritan, uh, Arles' husband, and Hi. Uh, I have a question that's probably a little bit unusual, and you may not ever deal with it, but do you ever hear much about uh, short-tailed shrews in Lincoln? Used to have short-tailed shrews in my backyard and haven't seen any for a long time. No, I, ha I have never, huh? -uh. I don't, I can ask the, the people that have been rehabbers for a while, you know, we get calls about, you know, field mice and, um, you know, things like that, ground squirrels, but I have not, I have I don't think we've ever, ever gotten a shrew in. Do you know how long ago that was? Yeah, it's been 20, 30 years ago, but somebody mm -hmm. told me that, that there are quite a few short-tailed shrews in Lincoln. Okay. Well, I don't know if that's true or not. Yeah, I don't either. I'll have to do some research. You know, it's kind of like um, crayfish, right? When I was a kid, we found crayfish all the time in the cricks and things like that. Now you hardly ever see them. So, um, and salamanders, right? We used to have salamanders, mm -hmm. you know, and those have all moved out of eastern Nebraska into, you know, west. And um, yeah, so I know they've been doing a lot of research as far as trying to find out why salamanders have disappeared. And one other question real quickly, what kind of ground squirrels do you find? Is it the 13 lined ground squirrels? Yep, the 13 line ones, yes. Okay. Yeah. So if you rescue a, an animal that's part of the Games and Parks uh, Natural, the Legacy Project, or do you report that, report that to them or do anything in addition to, to the rehab? We have to report all of our animals to Game and Parks. Um, so, and we have, but that's at the end of the year. Um, but the, if there is um, an endangered species, you know, threatened species, something like that, then yeah, we do have to contact them um, and report it. Um, mm. You know, why, and then, you know, we talk about a plan and things like that as far as what needs to be done with that, with that animal, yes. But yeah, we keep track of all the animals. We have acquisition forms that we fill out on where they're found, what their injury is, um, if they were released, if they were euthanized, if they passed. Um, and then we have to turn all of that in at the end of every year. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Do, you re do you rehabilitate house mice? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we do have... <laughs> We do have a rehabber that will take in mice and yeah, um, if we get a call and it's, you know, orphaned and we will, yeah, we will, you know, and that's just like, um, you know, starlings, you know, the, some of the invasive species, um, there are, you know, there are other organizations around the country, you know, that won't rehab those type of animals. Um, we rehab all. You know, we, we don't pick and choose which animals get saved. I do not do the mice, though. <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't put them near the snakes, either, in the same right. area. Yeah. Do you ever get any other kind of snakes besides the garter snake? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so rat snakes, bull snakes. Um, yeah. Okay. 
and I don't, you know, I don't think um, we get too many snakes in. Um, you know, I don't know the numbers on the snakes, but um, yeah, we, we can get a variety of them, but we don't get, a, we don't get many. Mm. Uh, oh, by the way, um, the short-tailed shrews are venomous, as I understand it. Oh, they're, they're like the only venomous mammal in North America, I believe. If I'm interesting, I yeah, I think that's well, true. I, now I'm really interested in shrews. <laughs> <laughs> if you find I enough, love, I love misunderstood animals. I really do, <laughs> Carrie. If you find uh, some good information, write it up, and we'll put it in the newsletter as an article. Sounds good. Yeah, I, I can do what that. If, <laughs> what if you can't? Uh, save an animal what do you do that's that's a good question if they can't be rehabbed and released um so we will reach out to different nature preserves zoos things like that to see if they have space um for them um unfortunately um we have to release um center nature preserve or they we do have to euthanize mm -hmm. um but that doesn't happen you know, very often. And then of course, if the injury is um, so great that they can't be um, uh, rehabbed, um, then we do have to do euth euthanasia. So we have vets, um, you know, that we um, are connected with that will help us with that. Um, we have vets that will um, help do surgeries, um, things like that too. Um, but, you know, there are some situations where it's just in the best interest of the um, of the animal um, to, you know, to um, be put down. Yeah. yeah. I, I have a question. If you can hear me, I'm not sure. Yeah. Hi. Um, hi. One, one of the things I noticed uh, in my neighborhood was we had a fairly large bunch of robins that fed at the uh, water uh, containers uh, just before this big drop in temperatures we had last winter, it got down to be 30 below, I guess. What, what did you notice after that big drop in temperature? Or did you notice anything? Unusual? Yeah, so, so, you know, I just took over as bird team leader this year. Um, so I can't really speak about um, last year, I guess. Um, but I do know when we've had um, some of those really hot um, temperatures, here that I get a lot more calls, you know, about um, birds that are down. And, you know, when that happens, then, you know, I bring them in and I do um, giving them fluids and things like that, just getting them in out of the heat. So I imagine, you know, um, with the cold, it was, we'll see, you know, this winter, you know, cause I'll be the team leader. Um, you know, I'll definitely see what, what happens then. But, you know, just like with the opossums, you know, I had never noticed before their fur growing so thick. Um, and they were all like that. It wasn't just a couple of them. I had several different parcels of opossums and all of them um, had really thick fur like that. And then in the spring, when spring came around, um, I received no calls about opossums. So I can only imagine, you know, that, you know, they just didn't make it through the winter. Or their thick fur was enough to uh, keep them keep them safe and healthy. Yeah, yeah. But I usually get you know um, yeah, usually too. they start wandering around you know and I'll we'll get them hit by cars and then you get babies in. Um, and we didn't get any of those calls. So, but that's true too. Maybe it kept them healthy for longer and they you know stayed bundled down until you know later in the summer too. That's true. Yeah. Other questions? No. Just thanks for their work. Thank yes. you. Thanks for yeah. Yeah. a lot it, of good work there. It takes a, a big team for sure. And, you know, people don't understand the commitment level. You know, we have a lot of uh, members that want to rehab. They have great intentions, you know, and but then when it comes down to, you know, you don't vacation during certain times of year, you know, you um, it's hard to have a full time job. Um, we do all of our driving around, um, you know, we pay for our own gas. So if we're driving around picking up animals, you know, I get on busy days, I get, you know, like 30 calls a day just on birds, you know, so I have to navigate picking them up, you know, or trying to educate people to leave them alone. 
Um, it takes a, a big commitment. It takes a, your family has to be on board too. So I'm really lucky that I have, you know, my family, I do homeschool, you know, so my kids are a big part of cleaning cages and feeding and making formula and um, all of that. So um, it's a big commitment and, um, but it's worth it too. <laughs> Yes, well, thank you to, to you and, and the whole organization. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us. I would like to just um, remind people that if they want to donate or volunteer, please look on the front page of the um, September newsletter and their website and phone number is there if you'd like to make a donation or volunteer. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, you so much. All right. Yeah, let's give her, give Carrie a big round of applause. And thank you all uh, very much for joining us tonight. Uh, any, any last tidbits that anyone has before we all sign off into the, into the night? Thank you for all that you're doing. Really appreciate yes. it. I donated it to uh, Give to Lincoln Day to your organization. Thank you so much. That was a big, that was, we had our, we had our best year this year with Give to Lincoln Day. Great. So thank you. Great. Yes. All right, folks, we'll have a good evening. And again, thank you. Thank you all for joining us. We'll see you next month. Not before. Bye. 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 Bye.